Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to Talk to Ross. To the beam. Como você está? So, today I'm really excited about this episode. It's all about Irish music. The history of Irish music. Some of the things maybe you never knew. Maybe some of the things you learned today is all new. Let's see how it goes. Welcome back to Talk to Ross. Bora! Okay guys, so let's get right into this video. First of all, again, thank you so much for all the follows, uh, all the likes, it's been amazing here on YouTube and on my Instagram page, which is Talk to Ross. Make sure you hit subscribe, all the links are down below in the description. Thank you for your support. Okay, straight away guys, where did Irish music come from? As we know it, um, there was a group of people called the Celts that many of us are descended from. They originated in continental Europe, um, and they say that apparently they got a lot of their influence for music from the eastern side of Europe. Uh, the Celts decided to travel over towards the western side, towards northern France, northern Spain, what's now Scotland, Wales, a little bit of uh, England, the kind of Cornwall area, and of course over to us here in Ireland. Um, it's said that the Celts arrived here in about the year 500 BC, um, and over the years music developed. Um, we had places like, you know, the Hill of Tara, which is the head of spiritualism in Ireland and where the High Kings would have sat for many, many years. So music would have developed there. Predominantly, it would have been percussive at first, you know, percussion instruments. And um, going right forward, right past Viking times, I'm talking like maybe into the 10th century, up until the 17th century, actually, was probably... Um, the fruition or the growth of uh, probably one of our most iconic musical instruments, which is called the Irish harp. Beautiful music, yeah. So the Irish harp, stringed instrument, you need to have really delicate little fingers. I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of like kind of sausage fingers. Uh. But that was the principal instrument that developed in Ireland over that period of time. Um, two of the most principal people, I suppose, of the time was a man called Turlock O'Carolan and also a man called Rory Dahl O'Cahan. Now, um, Rory Dahl O'Cahan was the uh, author, or the composer, should I say, this is music, author, bleh, uh, of a very famous Irish piece called Tower Dum Malov, which basically means take my hand, follow my hand. Um, it's, it's heard, I've heard it at wedding ceremonies here in Ireland. Very beautiful piece of music. I will link all of this music in the description down below, guys. Um, and then about a hundred years later, um, the aforementioned Turlock O'Carolan. Uh, he was born in the latter end of the 17th century. He was a blind harper, so he was an absolute genius. Couldn't see the strings, couldn't read music, but he had uh, the talent in his fingers and he had his ears too. Another cool little fact about the Irish harp, guys, is we in Ireland were the only country in the world with a musical instrument the harp as our national emblem so on our passport there you go national harp now things did not always go according to plan for our Irish traditional music um, in the early part of the 17th century we had some pretty harsh laws that were put onto us by the British something called the penal laws which was we weren't allowed to express uh, religion openly, our heritage openly, our language openly. Um, you weren't allowed to own land if you were a Catholic, of which Ireland was almost 100% Catholic at the time, almost. Um, so we, you know, our arts and our culture suffered for many, many years throughout that, and it took a few hundred years for it to recover. Um, so yeah, wasn't just rose petals. So that's kind of uh, the early stages of Irish traditional music. Okay, so we were in the 17th century the last time. Let's move forward a little bit. Uh, let's go towards the end of the 1880s. Here in Ireland, we had something called the Gaelic League, which was established. It was established because at the time, we were in a lot of danger of losing our Irish heritage and our culture from the penal laws that I just mentioned. Um, so, you know, the likes of uh, Charles Stuart Parnell would have been influential in this thing called the Gaelic League, very influential Irish politician. 
Um, a lot of Irish nationalists, what we call, you know, uh, influential people who wanted Irish independence from Britain. They started to revive this thing called the Gaelic League, get it formed in terms of sport even. Um, the GAA, which is the Gaelic Athletics Association, is still the largest amateur sports association in the world and it's in Ireland. And it was rejuvenation of not just sports, also literature, also music. You have to remember in the 1880s, a lot of Irish people, they didn't know about our history because a lot of our Irish history was illegal. So it was the reawakening, the rejuvenation of Irish people and their interest in all things Irish music, heritage, culture. Um, if we go into the 20th century, for example, Irish traditional music for the most part was played at home and in pubs, you know, it was played for entertainment and for dancing. Um, and believe it or not, with the advent of new technology at the time, which was 78 uh, RPM uh, record players, uh, Irish music got faster. So, you know, it would have been a tempo at first of and then it went so it went faster and faster and with that the musicians got faster and the dancing got faster and everybody got crazy drank more beer oh my god it's going real crazy yeah it was it was nuts it was crazy over the water in England, the Beatles came around in the 1960s in Liverpool, the city closest to Dublin in Ireland, believe it or not. Um, something like 70% of people from Liverpool claim Irish heritage, Irish ancestry. So it's also the reason why a lot of Irish people, like me, support Liverpool. Flamengo fans, I'm really, really sorry. The Beatles were sons predominantly of uh, Irish immigrants. Um, apart from Ringo, the drummer, uh, he had no Irish blood, but uh, John Lennon, George Harrison, Paul McCartney, they all claimed Irish heritage. And what was happening here in Ireland, something called the show band scene, which was um, the dance halls of Ireland would have been filled, filled to the brim every weekend of couples dancing, uh, bands playing songs by the likes of the Beatles, Roy Orbison, Elvis, etc you know, playing music from um, other countries. Um, of course, here in Ireland in the 1960s, we had our own show band people like Dickie Rock, Brendan Boyer, um, these kind of people, you know, and maybe stuff that my parents would have danced to. Actually, I think my parents did dance to those kind of guys, <laughs> for sure, I think. Uh, in the 1970s, in the next decade in Ireland, signalled the beginning of the rock revival. The rock came to Ireland. So the likes of Tin Lizzy um, and Horse Lips, even in Irish traditional music, there was there was uh, Planksty. Um, let's see, who else did we have? Well, we had the Bothy Band, we had Van Morrison, Boomtown Rats, and the formation of a little band from Dublin called U2. Yep, that's right. Uh, U2 formed here in Dublin in the middle of the 1970s, I think 1976, and they've gone on to be Ireland's largest musical export. They've sold like 17 billion albums, won 24,000 million um, Grammy Awards. I think Bono has a house on the moon. Um, they've gone really, really big. But uh, yeah, around the world, if I've traveled, um, people will say to me, oh, you're Irish, yeah, Bono. Oh, you too, even when I went to Brazil. Uh, you guys call Bono, Bono Vox for some reason. I have no idea why that is. Now, I know where Bono got his name from. It was called after, um, his name was after a hearing aid store in Dublin and it's called Bona Vox. But um, I never knew that the whole title went across to Brazil. Yeah, here in, in Europe we call him Bono. But all my Brazilian friends say Bono Vox, Bono Vox. <laughs> The popularity of U2, um, it sent nearly every major record company from America over here to Ireland to find the next U2. So the likes of bands like Something Happens, An Emotional Fish, is that an amazing name? Uh, Our House, um, they have an amazing song called Endless Art. Check it out, I'm gonna link everything in the biggest description down below. And also Aslan, um, one of Ireland's finest rock bands. Um, They'd be like, 
you know, these bands would be like our version of you guys have MVP, you know, national music. So absolutely fantastic bands, well worth your time. Um, the 1980s were also signaled, um, you know, a sad time. We lost two very important people in, in the music world in Ireland. First of all, in 1984, the lead singer of um, the traditional band, the Dubliners, his name was Luke Kelly. We've got two statues dedicated to him uh, in Dublin. We got greedy. Why have one when you can have two? Um, he passed away in 1984. Yeah, yeah. One of Ireland's finest ever voices. Check out uh, the Dubliners. Amazing, amazing heartfelt music. Uh, two years later, we also lost uh, the lead singer of Thin Lizzy, um, a man called Phil Linnett. He passed away, yeah, early 1986. He had an Irish mother. And some places say that his dad was from Brazil, but his dad was actually from uh, French Guyana, which is just north of you guys, up on the map there. Um, so yeah, the middle of the 1980s, we lost two big heavyweights in uh, Irish music. Um, the 1990s we're into now, that signalled a renaissance of Irish music again. Uh, we had the likes of The Cranberries, rest in peace Dolores, we had Picture House, we had Relish, we had Hot House Flowers, we had The Saw Doctors, we had so much music, the live music scene was budging, Enya was everywhere, absolutely beautiful music. As a matter of fact, uh, as beautiful as Enya's music is, believe it or not, she can't tour because her vocals are layered, layered, absolutely wonderful music. And also, in the 1990s in Ireland, we had Riverdance. Cue the music. Cue the music. Woo, 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 woo. So yeah, Riverdance is one of our probably most, um, famous um, theatrical productions, incorporates Irish dance music. Um, a man called Michael Flatley and a lady called Jean Butler were the two um, main dancers behind it. Um, and it has spread all the way throughout the world. I think it's been played in Sao Paulo, it's been played in Rio, um, in Japan, in Tokyo, in London, all around the world. Yeah, one of our, it's probably our largest musical theatre exports for sure, definitely. But the 1990s were a fantastic time for live music here in Ireland. Ireland. Unfortunately, in Ireland, we also had the emergence of the boy band scene. So, you know, there was the Backstreet Boys in America, there was Take That in England, so we had the likes of Boyzone and Westlife. Yeah, they sell a lot of concerts, but I'm sorry, it's not my kind of music. Yeah, I just thought I'd kind of say that. Coming into the 2000s here in Ireland, guys, um, it was the emergence of the singer-songwriter um, scene here in Ireland predominantly. You had the likes of Glenn Hansard, um, you know, from the movie Once, his band The Frames. There was Mick Christopher, there was Declan O'Rourke, there was David Kitt, there was Damien Rice, there was Damien Dempsey. With the girls, we had Lisa Hannigan, we had Gemma Hayes. These are all fantastic. Fantastic, fantastic artists from Ireland that you guys need to check out for sure. It also signaled um, the beginning of regular summer festivals in Ireland. At first we had a festival called Witness, where the likes of Foo Fighters, Green Day, etc. would have headlined. Later on, Oxygen, where the Prodigy, The Who, uh, Nine Inch Nails, all these international acts started to come to Ireland. We started to gain confidence as a nation and start to uh, really embrace music culture again. And of of course, um, Irish artists were filling out venues all over the place. Um, there was, uh, briefly in Ireland, a very kind of controversial thing called pay to play, where bands had to pay the promoters to play, and sometimes you could have been playing in front of three people and uh, the sound engineer. Did I do that? Yeah, I did. But when you're young and you want to have a concert in Dublin city centre, you do these kind of things, don't you? So what's been happening in the last 10 years or so here in Ireland, the 2010s into 2020? Um, there has been a big, you know, kind of a cover band scene, you know, the larger bands like Alice in Chains and Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, U2, you know, they released all their better music in the last 20 or so years. So there's lots of cover bands actually, uh, Queen cover bands, etc. Um, there's also, if you like your rock music in Ireland, there's a huge metal scene. I mean, the metal scene is huge. I've got friends in bands and they're called Psychosis. There's This Place, Hell, Dead Label, Zora. There's also um, good friends of mine who live 
in the same town as me, Rush, here in Dublin. Their name is Fine Club. They've played with Metallica and the Smashing Pumpkins, the Pixies, you name it. Again, links are gonna go for everybody down below. Fine Club are great, very kind of grungy style. Um, as well as that, we also have kind of, kind of pop rock bands. If you like stuff like Coldplay and stuff like that, bands like The Coronas, uh, The Script, Code Line, etc. And um, also we have a guy who looks like me, apparently, Gavin James. He wishes I'm much more handsome, you know? <laughs> yeah, in Ireland, believe it or not, we have a huge hip-hop scene as well. So even ladies like Denise Chalia, uh, men like Reggie Snow, and the crazy rubber bandits from Limerick, uh, their song Horse Outside is just a bona fide Irish classic. Everybody knows it. Um, again, if you want to find out more about Irish music, I've said it before, I'm going to link everything down here. It's going to be a huge big book of links. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you're from Brazil and you live in Dublin, you're going to visit Dublin one day and you want to find some local um, music acts to play um, in the various venues around Dublin. Some of the best ones I can name, there's Fibbers, there's Berlin, yes it's a city in Germany but also a, a music venue in Dublin. There's also Grand Social, there's Drop Dead Twice, there's Shin A, the list goes on and on. So again, loads of links in the description below. Um, that about wraps it up for me today, guys. I'd like to thank you all once more for your support. Make sure you hit subscribe down below. Click the bell notification. Give this video a big like. I'm gonna leave some links to uh, some of my other videos in the end screen just above my head here. But for now, I'd just like to say thank you so much and talk to Ross. I will see you very, very soon. Ciao, ciao! Woo, woo!